Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining me as we continue to look at Colossians, the book of Colossians. This week we're looking at, um, not uh, uh, that we're looking at, yes, the whole thing is being complete in Christ. That And by that I mean it finds its completion, finds its fulfillment. Um, it's interesting that for the Hebrew mind, being perfect, and the Greek mind, perfect meant uh, without flaw, without blemish. For the Hebrew mind, being perfect meant fulfilling its purpose. And so um, you can be, from the Hebrew perspective, perfect in following Christ and doing what you living out that purpose being a, and so it strikes us as funny as perfect but that's that's what this completion being being made complete in Christ uh, and this we were looking at Christ in us Christ in the believers uh, what that means and Paul's going to talk about that what that means that that, uh, that Christ in us he's going to talk about that uh, in these verses that we're looking at and today we're looking at verses 24 and 25 uh, only two, but they are tough verses because they strike us as funny. And when I read it, you'll understand. Paul is in prison. He said, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Lacking in Christ's afflictions? And how can I suffer for you? Uh, out of this church, I was, of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God, bestowed on me for your benefit that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God or, or to fully proclaim the Word of God. So really what hits us is, yes, Paul's suffering. How is he suffering for them? In what way is he suffering for their sake? Is he preventing them from suffering in some way? Or what is this all about? And in my flesh, in his flesh, he does his share on behalf of the body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. What is lacking in Christ's afflictions? What is, what in his slips as a uh, the the Greek word means affliction or tribulation? What what is lacking in that? Wasn't that finished on the cross? And what can Paul add to that? And what in the world is he talking about? Well, let's break it down piece by piece. First of all, he's saying I rejoice now. His it, he is um, I am rejoicing. I continue to rejoice uh, even now in prison for your sake. What's he rejoicing? Why is he rejoicing? Why is he rejoicing in the fact that he's in prison, that he's suffering? Well, he's in prison for preaching the gospel. He's in prison for proclaiming the good news, uh, Jesus Christ is Lord, uh, and what that means. He's been in prison for that. And he is suffering, and he says it's for the sake of these Colossians. Now, we know Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. It says that's declared over and over again by himself and also in Acts when uh, God speaks to Ananias to go and... Uh, lay hands on him and pray for him so that his eyesight will return. He said, uh, Lord, I don't want to go. And he says, no, you must go, but he is my chosen instrument, uh, and I will show him how much he is to suffer uh, for my sake. And so uh, Paul's ministry is a ministry of suffering. But what we have to understand before we get into this very much, we have to understand that for Paul, to be in Christ is, is to have Christ living in us. It's, it's tied together. Um, we are part of the body of Christ. And we are, and for Paul, all believers as part of the body of Christ are called to suffer as Christ suffered. Christ suffered vicariously for us to save us, to rescue us. Now, we don't add anything to that. That's a done deal. We don't change that. But we are to carry on that self-sacrificing suffering for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of proclaiming good news to those who do not know it. Uh, and there will be suffering involved in that. Uh, that should be the case. Now, we in the United States, we haven't had to suffer for that. And consequently, I don't think we have given much value. You know, you tend to value uh, that which costs you something, and we have it so easy. It's easy to proclaim Christ in the United States. I believe unless revival takes place, that's going to become even more difficult, more and more difficult, uh, that there will be uh, laws that are passed, that what we proclaim will be considered hate speech, uh, and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ it would be considered hate speech. Um, and who are we to proclaim that? And we will suffer as Paul suffered. We will be put in jail for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And, um, and so that's what he's talking about. So he says, I am rejoicing uh, because of this wonderful... He, he rejoices because he just, he just talked about the wonderful reconciliation that God has accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he can rejoice 
in suffering for the church, which is the body of Christ. So, yay, the, the, the church is uh, the body of Christ, and I am suffering on behalf of that church so that they don't have to suffer. Although, he suffers on their behalf so they can come into existence, but they will in turn suffer to bring other Christians to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. As they proclaim the good news, they will enter into that suffering as well. Um, one of the reasons, as N.T. Wright says, that we find it so strange, it sounds so strange to our ears, this whole concept of suffering is that because the church um, has lost sight of this idea of suffering on behalf of others for the sake of proclaiming the good news, that we've lost sight of that. And I tend to agree. Um, so he's not, he's not adding to what Jesus did on the cross. He is continuing the suffering ministry of Christ and proclaiming good news to captives to, that they might be set free. And so he rejoices in the fact that that is taking place, that um, he is suffering and the, the gospel is proclaimed and the church is expanding and he, he in some sense, he is suffering vicariously for them as well in the proclamation of the gospel so that it benefits them. They hear the good news. He suffers for it. They don't, although as they come into the faith, they will, in response, proclaiming the good news, will suffer as well. Um, maybe not to the degree that Paul is because Paul is an apostle uh, and they are just regular church members and they haven't got this stewardship of suffering that Paul talks about that he has. Although all believers are called to this ministry of suffering. As Christ suffered, so we are to suffer for the sake of others. Uh, and that's something that sounds really weird uh, to people today because it's such a self-centered, selfish kind of individualism that gets talked about that is the underpinning um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, uh, presupposition of our society today, is that it's all about self. It's all about self, um, um, self-identification, how I, and nothing should get in the way of my expressing myself and whatever that might be. Um, like that's the end all and be all of, of existence. No, uh, we are called as believers to share in the suffering of Christ, and that is proclaiming the good news, suffering for the sake of others, sacrificing ourselves for the sake of others. That's what we are to be about. Um, of this church, I was made a minister or a servant, a slave. Uh, diac uh, diaconos is the word that is used there. We get our, uh, our word deacon. It's a transliteration of that word, and it means slave, servant. Uh, a slur, a, a, a slave, a servant, a minister, uh, one who serves. Uh, 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 I was made a servant um, according to the stewardship from God that was God bestowed on Paul, that Paul, uh, that was given to Paul, this stewardship uh, from God. That a stewardship, a steward was a slave that was, uh, was given uh, charge of uh, something in the master's house, whether it was finances or whether it was the head steward was over the whole thing. Uh, Paul doesn't say that. He just says he was given a stewardship. Uh, so he has a stewardship. He has a ministry, a service to perform and that God has given it to, for him to do. And so um, he sees his position as one of servitude to God. As a steward, he must give an account of what has been entrusted to him by God for the sake of Christ. He has been entrusted with what? Proclaiming the good news, establishing the church, um, proclaiming Jesus as Lord. That's been that's his stewardship. Uh, to, to establish churches, proclaim the good news, uh, to uh, strengthen those churches, because that is the body of Christ. That is the people of God, Jew and Gentile, together making up the people of God, those who are reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ, his finished work on the cross, his resurrection. So that's what he's been talking about, and that's what he's talking about now. That And by he's introducing himself to this congregation that doesn't know him. He doesn't know them. And so he's introducing who he is, that he has this stewardship from God, proclaiming the good news to the Gentile world. And it's for their benefit that he is suffering in prison. It's a good thing that he is suffering in prison because it prevents them from suffering so that they can hear the good news. And so this stewardship is for the church's benefit so that they can be established. And he says this last thing. Um, 
that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. I would translate that this way, that I might fully proclaim uh, the word of God. Uh, that that's in the New American Standard, the, the preaching of, that's not in there. It is really the, uh, the, the fullness of God to you uh, that Paul is to proclaim. That's his ministry. That's his service to fully proclaim the word of God uh, to you. Now, what does that mean? Ultimately, it means proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord. But it also means taking the full counsel of the word of God, which for Paul was the Old Testament, and seeing, uh, and it's a remarkable thing to see this wonderful story of God's plan of rescue, uh, moving through Abraham, through, um, through the, uh, the children of Israel, the 12 tribes, and the Davidic king, and the promises that are made, and that um, the, the suffering servant of Isaiah, and how God is moving and doing this, and, and it narrows down to this representative, because Israel needs to be uh, saved, the Gentile nations need to be saved, and Jesus is that righteous representative of Israel, that the, the king who represents Israel, the Davidic king that was promised, the one who was promised way back in Genesis chapter 3, who would come and deliver humanity from evil and wickedness and from sin and death. And so uh, that's the good news that Paul is telling, that he has come, that, that Christ has come, and, uh, and, and reconciliation has been made through his cross and, and, his, and his body. His death and resurrection has, uh, the resurrection demonstrates the truth of it. The cross uh, is, is the place that, um, that sin is dealt with and that liberty is found for humanity, not just Israel, but the Gentile nations as well. And so Paul has this stewardship of pro fully proclaiming the word of God, the full counsel of the word of God. But especially uh, for Paul, the, the meaning of the word of God is to proclaim Jesus Christ. And now, how do we live? How do we live out uh, lives that are uh, acceptable God, pleasing to God? Uh, and he's going to talk about that in the next verses. And so we'll continue that tomorrow. And I hope that, I hope I didn't stir it up and just make it really muddy. Uh, but Paul is not adding anything to the cross of Christ, to the suffering of Christ. What he is, what he is adding to um, is his personal suffering. Um, and we could get into details about the word, what is lacking. Uh, if you remember when Epaphroditus comes and he says that uh, he gave thanks for the Philippians for their gift, that Epaphroditus has come and filled up what was lacking. He's not saying that that he got out of his own, Epaphroditus got out of his own pocket some money and, and their gift was stingy and so he made it better. That's what it sounds like to us when we read that passage. But that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that Epaphroditus coming, what was lacking in the gift is their presence. They weren't there. Paul's presence is there. He is suffering. He is one with Christ and suffering for them vicariously, carrying on the suffering ministry of Christ. That's what he's talking about, not adding to the cross or anything else. But he is talking about his stewardship of proclaiming the good news is a stewardship of suffering. And we are, as believers, called to suffer along with Christ as well, a, a ministry of suffering. And we don't like to think about that. We don't like to talk about that. But that is exactly what we are called to do. And I'll give some scriptures on that tomorrow. Uh, we'll get into that. Um, but right now, uh, just I hope I didn't muddy it up. I hope I cleared it up some of what Paul is not saying. He's not saying that he is adding something to the cross of Christ. No one can do that. That's a finished and done deal. He is joining with Christ and being joined with Christ through uh, being born again. He carries, and having the stewardship of proclaiming the good news, establishing churches, there is suffering that is involved in that, and that is tied with, with Christ and his suffering ministry. And so Paul is suffering uh, on their behalf. Okay, I hope I, uh, I hope I made that a little bit clearer. Uh, and <laughs> if I didn't, hopefully we'll clear it up tomorrow. Uh, until then, I pray that you know the love of God, that he loves you so much he gave his son Jesus, that you might have forgiveness to say in eternal life. Joy indescribable right here and right now. I pray that you know that. Uh, and I pray that you know that uh, I love you and Troy First Baptist loves you as well because the love of God is here in the presence of Jesus Christ. Um, may God's peace, the peace that only comes from Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, and he wants to give you that gift as a follower of his, um, peace, assurance that God is working all things out. He's got, he's got this. You don't have to worry and be concerned. You can rest peace with God.
I pray that that's yours, my friend. Until we meet again tomorrow, shalom.